Uh, so, apologies from Sarah. She got stuck uh, missing her flight, unfortunately. So she might be here later today or possibly tomorrow. So if you do have any questions, then you'll probably be able to see her then. I think she's talking again tomorrow in the session. Um, also, at the end of this, she's left her email. So if you have questions, you can direct them towards her. Can everyone hear me if I talk at this? Yeah, cool. Right. Okay. Okay, so I'll take the first couple of minutes to explain the basic ideas underpinning this project and then move on to the more specific questions presented in the abstract. Okay, so shipwrecks are often understood, even by archaeologists who study them, as little more than dead ships. Given that many cultural groups throughout time have assigned a great deal of autonomy to ships and boats, what happens to that autonomy when they're reduced to wreckage at the bottom of the sea? Ships abound with bodily metaphors, so hull planking as skin, frames as bones, wood as blood. But how are those metaphors adapted to the new forms that occur with the supposed death of the ship body? Shipwreck hauntography is a new project that seeks to explore, through archaeological and artistic processes, shipwrecks as liminal objects that are capable of negotiating those murky, fluid boundaries between past and present, self and other, and particularly between life and death. But like ghosts in a flooded and forgotten storm cellar, shipwreck realities are so far removed from our own that they exist in a kind of ontological void. This state of limbo hopes to be addressed through processes similar to how Ian Bogos describes ontography, the pursuit of object interaction through collocation. In the case of these quiet, broken vessels that exist both beyond and despite our access, the project hopes to promote a thorough re-evaluation of shipwrecks as bygone yet enduring objects that generate a sense, and a skin-tingling one at that, of extra human realities and ocean literacy, particularly within the fields of art and archaeology. So in thinking about shipwrecks as objects, whether artefact or art or architectural work, and how these categories relate to each other, again, Graham Harmon and Ian Bogost's idea of an ontograph comes to mind. An ontograph would depict, in whatever format, the way of being of a given object. Bogost further describes an ontograph as messy, another quality that art and archaeological processes share. His broad definition invites interpretation of complex archaeological sites that may or may not be aesthetically pleasing in and of themselves, but which foster a movement <coughs> towards an in-depth experience of a normally hidden object place. Existing in their voluminously foreign, violet-black, murky green and higher line blue worlds, shipwrecks are notoriously isolated, secluded, really physically withdrawn from human accessibility. Shipwrecks are not present or absent, they're not dead or alive. They characterise a near ontological void, the lack of a sense of presence, which leads to a lack of perceived being, in Derridian terms, a hauntology. In this respect, a hauntograph might still better address that tension in space, public and private, accessible and withdrawn, <coughs> and the temporal tensions felt as we interpret and relay the bygone yet enduring. Because even though the shipwreck does exist, regardless of the human gaze, if we are its ontographers, we're limited to and by our access. So we can never really be ontographers, but hauntographers instead. Drifting materials in time, shifting forms in space, presence, like the present, is an apparition. Borrowing its title from the Adrian Rich poem, Diving into the Wreck, this paper, <laughs> this paper will attempt to address how exactly shipwreck and archaeologists confront each other, and how the roles of haunter and haunted can switch through processes of nautical inquiry. As works of art and architecture, traditional sailing ships hold a special place within the human imagination. Their designs were responses to aesthetics, techni and telos, while their capacity to metaphorise liminality is incomparable. As the ultimate objects of mobility, ships and boats also, also literalise metaphor, so meta, across, and forian, carry. A fleeting moment, a naval fleet. Both have etymological origins in the Old English, floaten, to drift, float or flow. The object is inextricable from its temporal, spatial passage and physical form. Ships are collections authenticated by the past, but somehow they're also souvenirs authenticating the past. And as both, they physically and metaphorically mediate time and space. But what about shipwrecks, who have failed in their task of carriage? So while we think of ships as transporters and connectors, like other tools, once they break, they're disposed of and become forgotten rejectamenta, removed from the human social sphere. 
And yet when archaeologists examine them, we go to great lengths to reinstate their authentic socio-cultural statuses, possibly at the expense of other endeavours. Shipwreck contography hopes to challenge the typical academic position towards the study of shipwrecks, which tends to approach broken ships as though they are dead ships, waiting passively on the seabed to be resurrected by human intervention. By no means am I suggesting that standard procedures of nautical archaeology should be substituted with art-making processes. 3D modelling and other digital, digital visualisation methods make invaluable contributions to both the archaeological and artistic epistemologies that compose ontographic or hauntographic processes. However, one main difference between what I'm proposing in this project and what's considered standard nautical archaeological practice has to do with linear, linearity. A shipwreck contograph would not necessarily be linear like a biography or topographical like a map. It would not be ordered like a site plan or act as a window to another dimension like a trompe de l'oeil. I apologise for my French, there's a few French words I'm not very good. Um, it might be all or none of these things, but it would relay somehow the way it might be to be that shipwreck. Like ghosts with perpetually unfinished business, the shipwreck contographer's work would never be done because there's no end point, no sense of finality. Another issue raised in shipwreck contography addresses the paradox of the underwater sensorium. As architects of ruins, nautical archaeologists are both historians and makers as they rebuild ships from shipwrecks. In processes of quasi-resurrection, ships are often reconstructed hypothetically based on information negotiated from the wreckage underwater. So where it came from, where it was going, which materials constructed it, when it sailed, who and what it carried, <coughs> why it wrecked, and how it has been interacting with its underwater environment all along. Yet to accrue the information needed to perform this miraculous resurrection, nautical archaeologists cannot rely on the primacy of vision as those who work on land do. Indeed, submersion dulls or nullifies each of the five senses, classically used in scientific and artistic inquiry. Underwater, sight is untrustworthy, smell and taste are non-existent, touch is numbed, and hearing is dominated by the sound of your own breathing. Other non-senses betray us too, so water undermines the sense of passing time, and even common sense declines with, decrease, with increasing depth. So vision, the sense we most commonly rely upon to perform investigations of all kinds, is diminished by water, which metre by metre absorbs light that isn't reflected from the surface. Colours with longer wavelengths, like red and yellow, top. Uh, disappear in the first few metres, so colours with short wavelengths like blue and violet endure the depths better. Additionally, our human eyes need to focus, need air to focus properly, so underwater we wear masks to negotiate the effect of water on our corneas. However, the masks also distort size and distance, so objects appear 25% closer and 33% larger than they are in reality. Still beyond these facts of physics, different bodies of water have different types of personalities, so to speak. Those of us working in the English Channel, for example, often experience zero visibility due to sediments suspended in mid-water that make it impossible to see objects, except for those sediments, um, often when these objects are just inches away from your eyes. Hearing, the next in line in this hierarchy of senses, is of course possible underwater because sound travels faster through water than air due to higher density. However, there are a number of limiting factors, including depth, uh, ambient noise from boat traffic, many, many different factors. In most cases, the sound of one's own breathing is the dominant noise underwater when exhaling results in a curtain of bubbles bursting out the regulator. Of the final three senses of the human sensorium, smell, touch and taste, only touch is of any use at all underwater. Smell and taste are obliterated for the obvious reasons of specialised equipment that covers the nose and the mouth, so that we can breathe, making all of that noise. Um, and of course, touch is also hindered by layers of neoprene and rubber that protect our earthbound bodies from the water. Completely, you can see, gloves and all, um, which constantly tries to suck the heat from our skin. Even without gloves on our hands, the water renders our flesh soft and often numb from colder ambient temperatures. Due to the little understood effects of nitrogen on our nervous systems, when breathing comp air at comp compressed air at depth, um, those working underwater frequently experience a lack of common sense called nitrogen narcosis. The greater the working depth, the less common sense can be relied upon. Some of us experience this ineptitude even at shallow depths, simply due to the uncanny nature of the world underwater. It's this uncanniness that has drawn artist philosopher Bracker Ettinger to refer to water as space without time. 
And indeed, when underwater, the sense of passing time is obfuscated entirely, so that 20 minutes can seem like two, or if decompressing in midwater, two minutes seems like 200. This uncanny breakdown of the senses and non-senses is like a dystopesthesia, where procuring knowledge is also a lesson in how fleeting existence is and how feeble our bodies are when they don't really belong in the first place. As much as we think of shipwrecks as being the haunted ones, we are also the ones haunting them, somehow existing in a world for which we are not designed, perpetually grabbing at what's there in an attempt to complete our unfinished business. Although Adrienne Rich's poem was written as a feminist metaphor for historical power relations between genders, her words still resonate if read with a little more of a literal interpretation. From the perspective of someone trying to learn about this shipwreck, you can see the poem up here. So, the thing I came for, the wreck and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself and not the myth, the drowned face always staring toward the sun, the evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty, the ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. Aristotle explained that sensory relationships are composed of three different participants, organ, object, medium. The medium in our case is water. This medium cannot be overcome no matter how technologically advanced or expensive our equipment. Instead, the medium is consulted. But again, if the object is a shipwreck and we are the organ, yet those organs are inhibited by the medium, what does this leave us with? How do archaeologists negotiate information from shipwrecks underwater? How is truth formulated during diver ground truthing? These are just a few questions that compose my own unfinished business. But there are some non-senses that underwater archaeologists may be using in their negotiating process, but which we rely upon only subconsciously. So kinesthesia, knowing through movement, through navigation and the placement of one's body in relation to the object of study, of sensing distance by how much physical exertion it takes to get from one part of the wreck to another. Synesthesia, the coming together of bits of information gathered through all of the available senses. Amesthesia, acquiring information through the collective synesthetics and kinesthetics of groups of divers working together, perceiving differences and corroborating their varied aesthetic experiences, a consensus, if you will. Voile, in Michel Serres's The Five Senses, even though much of it should be read with irony, the veil can be seen as something like Aristotle's medium, but it consists of layers that must be peeled back in the processes of unveil or reveal. However, the veil also implies an entangled gradual activation of truth, not just an exposure thereof. Visite. This activation is made possible through multiple repeated visitations and the information produced during each, which then builds up layers of knowledge. Each visitation, in turn, produces another veil, another layer that adds to the entanglement of the sensory experience. In this way, the veils and the visitations are mutually reproducing. Serres' so-called senses or non-senses could be helpful when applied to archaeology and our dealings with physical and metaphysical layers. In brief conclusion, um, and I was meant to point out at the start that this is the preliminary um, work of this really new project. So a lot of the stuff that Sarah wanted to talk about is really uh, kind of bringing up more questions than answers, I suppose, at this stage. Um, so in brief conclusion, it could be of interest to further explore these five nonsenses and their potential for explaining how truths might be produced by humans working underwater and negotiating information from shipwrecks, the things we haunt and what we are haunted by. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for listening to Sarah's talk. Um, this is her email at the top here, so if you had questions, you can address them to Sarah, or hopefully, fingers crossed, actually see her tomorrow, and she could answer some of the, the questions that I won't be able to answer. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you.